Hello boys and girls, welcome back to the channel, uh, back to Nordai Classics. Um, I have recognized that uh, recently in the Nordai Classics series I started to upload uh, more than one game um, and sort of build it around a certain theme and I think that we actually lost a little bit of the essence of what Nordai Classics is about because originally my intention with the series was to introduce you to very famous games that have become, for one reason or another, a classical game and in the last two episodes of this series instead of that take I rather grab the motif and then uh, introduce the motif uh, by showing you games that are indeed classics but I sort of put the horse before the cart uh, with that scenario and so I thought that it would be a good idea to to go back to the original concept and um, sort of approach the theme via the game rather than the games via the theme if you will and uh, I chose one of my all-time favorites uh, which we are going to go through today and there is a reason why I chose this game and that is because not long ago I um, had a um, dual commentary match with uh, John Bartholomew uh, where I got uh, defeated in a spectacular fashion and um, not much before that uh, match took place, he uploaded onto his YouTube channel a really, really good video about the Hedgehog. I'm going to give you the link of that video if you are interested uh, under below in the description so that you can check that out. And um, I find that this was a meeting point between him and I because um, I am quite keen on the Hedgehog in general as well. And um, I do enjoy playing it and I do claim to know a little bit about the Hedgehog structure. And I thought that it would be a good idea to bring you a game that features the Hedgehog. And uh, I went back in the past a fair bit, in fact, all the way to 1972 to bring you an all-time classic uh, played by none other than Lev Pologayevsky versus uh, Lyubomir Tachnik. Now, if you don't know these dudes, um, Pologayevsky, I just checked, on the rating list of 1972, when this game was played, was equal third, only behind Fischer, Spassky and Petrosian. Whereas Tachnik uh, also peaked at uh, higher than 2600 in the 80s, some stage, I can't remember when, and uh, has been known to be a very famous theoretician, a very strong uh, all-arounder, a very good player, several times Slovakian champion, uh, remarkable chess coach and so on and this game took place at the Lutzen Olympia between Russia or Soviet Union then and uh, Slovakia and as you can see this uh, hedgehog that we are entering now is a little bit different from the one that John talked about in the sense that here the white bishop is fianchettoed which I personally prefer to play against when I'm uh, employing um, the hedgehog because I think that the structure that uh, the John video featured with the white pawns on f3 and e4 and g2 so the white pawn chain is like this they sort of make these bishops work really really hard because unless we get d5 break in which is one of the ultimate aims in the hedgehog it is very difficult for this bishop to find employment. Of course, we can play around that structure because by pacing the pawns like this, we can then play on this diagonal where white is somewhat weaker. And John's video is exploiting that theme, or rather talks about this theme and how to exploit that weakness really well. Nonetheless, I think black's job is a little bit easier here in this uh, fianchetto setup. That being said, there is a particular theme that pops up a lot in these variations that doesn't pop up in the f3e4 ones and that is that white often tries to pressure this d6 pawn in a variety of ways and so black really has to be very careful with move order issues in order to avoid an immediate defeat b3 97 so now 97 was uh, necessary instead if we can play castles then after bishop a3 we are in, we are in the world of hurt Whereas after knight d7, we can always chuck the knight in c5 to block the way of the bishop. Later on a move, oh, whoa, 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 don't ruin it already. Later on a move has become very topical in this line, which was queen f4 at one point in order to exert pressure onto d6 from different angles. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm not quite sure if I'm showing you the right move order. They played here um, knight g5 with the idea of take, taking and putting the knight back here and hitting this pawn here too. Perhaps it was played in a position where black is not castled yet and white hasn't played b3. So imagine that instead of b3 here, 
they would play queen f4 castles in knight g5. I think that this is some sort of theory with the intention of knight e4 back. There have been a fair few games played for this team, uh, and it has got a certain amount of danger from black's point of view because, as I said, the pressure on d6 can occasionally be annoying. Now, once the bishop settles for uh, b2, we are totally a okay. Queen b8 was the last move that needed to be played in order to make sure that no tactics like e5 work so the queen from here defends the bishop i'm not entirely sure why queen c7 wasn't played i would have to think about it for a second to find out the nuances and why and why not it uh, could or couldn't be played off by it sorry um yeah i think that um yeah it would this would be an interesting one to to look up later on sadly i was too lazy i remember that queen b8 was played but i'm not quite sure why it's more accurate than queen c7 Logic would such is that it tries to dodge some sort of knight d5 tricks. But uh, I don't really think that uh, we have got any of those dudes available. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Anyhow, queen b8, bishop b2, castles and knight back. Now I need to pause it for a second because... This is something uh, that we need to discuss. Knight d2 is a very ugly move to start with, and typically a move that was played a lot against the hedgehog structures back in the 70s, when they considered it to be clearly inferior because of the huge space advantage that white has. And so a lot of players approach the hedgehog as a, a position where they can maneuver around forever and eventually just win somehow. And this is exactly what Pologayevsky is doing here. And only later in the 80s did um, the top leading grandmasters of the world and of course the level below uh, explore really and understand the fine dynamics that the hedgehog offered. And as a direct consequence, a lot of GMs started to play, especially those who preferred a dynamic play where despite of the slight space disadvantage, there was a realistic chance for black to actually win games. So if you compare that to any e4, e5 opening, it's not really likely that black has a lot of chances uh, for a win if white doesn't try hard. But here, uh, because of the position is first of all asymmetrical and second of all remarkably flexible, a lot of stuff can be done for both sides. And uh, as we will see in this game, the aimless maneuvering and the aimless pushes and moving pieces back and forth don't pay off at all. So now Ftashnik put the queen back to c7 in order to connect his rooks. In the meantime, white is doing absolutely nothing meaningful. So for example, dropping the queen back to e3 after playing knight d2, in my opinion, is very silly because then why wouldn't you just drop back and then put the knight into d4, where it clearly stands a lot better than on d2. So here white, as I said, went on to some dodgy maneuvering that they thought that they can get away with because their concept was that if I shut down d5 and b5 sufficiently enough, then what does black have? And their answer to that question was that nothing at all, they are done. But that's not the case. Just because for the time being, you manage to hold these two off, it doesn't mean that my position has lost its elasticity and its values. I can still build on it. I can chuck this knight in the center. Occasionally I can throw this pawn up in your face, especially if I drop the knight back here. Sometimes when I play rook e8, I can expose the queen so that d5 works again. So there's a lot of life still in the uh, in the position and someone who has the hedgehog in their blood will play with incredible ease. Look at that, h3, h5. The very same thrust that John mentioned in his video and again, the same concept. Black wants to play h4, forcing g4. So let's play a random move. And ta-da! All of a sudden, the position is full of black holes. And these squares will be very easy for white. Uh, sorry, to, for black to occupy. All the white pieces are in such clumsy positions that they can't really do anything about the invasion of the black pieces. Super annoying. White played f4. Sort of trying to push black back, but at the same time, now this structure is ridiculously loose. H4 is hanging in the air, and I think that uh, white here is already on the back foot, incredibly enough, because it's uh, very difficult to keep these two pawns together. Queen c5 check is always in the air to put pressure on the diagonal, and in general, 
the center, the center is about to explode. It's ready to go. So after knight f3, Ftashnik didn't, ha didn't hesitate for a second and played d5. Now, whenever you get to play d5 in the hedgehog, it hardly ever is an equalizer. Like most of the times they say that if black gets to play d5 in the Sicilian, he equalizes with ease. In fact, to some extent, what I'm about to say applies to the Sicilian too, but in particular to the hedgehog. In my opinion, when black plays d5, it's not that he equalized, but it's that he took over the initiative and his position is already better. Now in this position, I think uh, Polugaevsky was still in denial. And I think that he still thought that his position was totally fine. Um, and that's because of back then it was somewhat more commonplace to play dogmatic chess and just go like, well, I haven't made a mistake. I'm dominating the whole board, queen side, center, and the king side. It would be against the logic, the inner logic of chess and against the laws of chess, really, to black, for black to have the upper hand here because what have they done? They developed their pieces in a very passive manner and now they try to break out. But the fact of the matter is that really white has weakened the king side dramatically. Now the diagonals that are going to open up will all hurt white an awful lot, whilst white actually can't really exploit his pace advantage. So the last mistake in this game, to which I think it was very difficult to come back, was c takes d5. Instead, uh, Pologaevsky needed to play immediate push-in to block this diagonal off. What I think he was hoping to do was to first take 4-sync, 3-take, and only then e5, where not only would he have the same setup, would have had the same setup that I just showed, but also he would have played against an isolated pawn on d5. Sadly, none of it was to be, because after re d, Vtachnik very, very correctly chucked in h4 as an in-between move and the white position is now going to collapse in a spectacular fashion. There is no way to hold the position anymore. It is beautiful that um, these two can be held properly. He played uh, knight takes h4 just to give you an example if uh, black sorry white tries to force black's hand before taking on h4 then we simply go check now the king can go to h2, but then we can take here with check. And if the king goes to the corner, then knight h5, and there is no remedy against um, knight takes g3 check. So that's what it is. Um, so yeah, Paul Polugaevsky tried his best. He took back with the knight, knight took pawn took, and queen took on f4. And there we go. So after the center has exploded and black played his cards and laid his cards on the table, now we clearly see what it resulted in. White's king is in severe danger. Black's pawn structure is fully intact. Every single black piece is meaningfully trained so that they can inflict damage on the king's side. Whereas the white pieces, whilst at first sight harmoniously developed, are actually just very sad bystanders bystanders and they are just watching the inevitable take take and this is where the last really really the last mistake was made by Polugaevsky although his position is already significantly worse I think his best chance to stay in the game would have been rook f1 instead he played e5 following another dogma of um, by which I don't mean to say by the way that Polugaevsky was a dogmatic player I tend to be quite dogmatic more often than not um, but yeah, I think his mindset was, all right, let's trade some dudes and try to su survive the storm. But he miscalculated the beautiful tactics here that makes this game such a beautiful standout. Check, king here. And I think what Pologevsky didn't reckon with was that here he saw that after queen in with the intention of mate, bishop takes check and queen h2 holds. What he didn't reckon with was this spectacular lead up to the same motif knight h5 threatening the check and winning the queen and only when the queen takes which is fully forced did he go into g3 and now simply there is no way to defend both mate threats it's a stunningly beautiful motif really really amazing stuff so one of the main point is that if bishop takes then we have got this very very spectacular checkmate so White tried his best uh, to keep things clocked up. He chucked the knight onto d5. Black took with the rook, of course. 
because now bishop takes still uh, results in mate and if the rook takes then we take with the bishop renewing the mate threats on both ends and now I'm threatening with check and then mate. In order to prevent this um, Polgevsky played rook f1 pretty much the only move that makes some sense because now he's hoping to give perpetual check back and forth between f7 and g2 f7 and h5 sorry my brain is ahead of my mouth but he overlooked the beautiful coup de grace which was in this queen sacrifice and after actually i think he, he resigned here but uh, the beautiful finish would have been king takes double check king up check king up rook here queen blocks either here or here it doesn't matter and checkmate a truly amazing finish to a really really lovely example once again we have to emphasize that in the early middle game white's play was very shaky so starting with knight e2 then queen e3 then queen e2 and then h3 white has played a lot of moves that nowadays we would label as passive pointless what are you doing mate sort of things but back then as i said it was considered to be a stock standard way to play against uh, the hedgehog because a they didn't quite know how to crack it but b because they firmly believed that their um, significant space advantage is just good enough to to net the game for free and this was one of the the biggest eye openers uh for many many players uh to realize that the hedgehog had real value and um, that they can actually attack with the hedgehog so i hope that you guys liked it i'm sorry for the phone call uh, I hope you guys liked it. Um, yeah, play through the video. I highly recommend you to do that because there were probably nuances I missed out on. And once you play through and you understand, understood the motives, you will appreciate the tremendous beauty of this game. So yeah, once again, I hope you liked it, guys. And this will be probably another good video to popularize the hedgehog and its uh, tricks, if you will. If you will. Um, and maybe many of you will pick it up now based on John and John's video. And hopefully this is a little contribution to that too. So tell me what you think. Tell me if you liked it. And uh, I will be back with more soon. Thank you. Bye.